Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on socialization and experiments. I think we should start off with some interesting and high-yield experiments for this socialization episode. We are going to go chronologically and thus begin with conformity experiments. Actually, Solomon Ash's conformity experiment in the 50s was not the first conformity experiment. The first conformity experiment was in the 30s by Muzaffar Sheriff and simply had people in a dark room looking at a light dot on the other wall, and they were asked how far it moved when they turned it off and turned it on. Then this was repeated when they were in a group. Because of the autokinetic effect, people thought the light moved, but in reality it didn't. It was just an illusion. Well, the average guess was about 2 to 6 inches. However, if participants averaged about 2 inches, or average saying about 6 inches, in the group, they actually conform to saying about 4 inches. However, this experiment is criticized because there is no actual right answer except for it didn't move. So Ash devised an experiment 20 years later where males were put in a room with seven confederates. They were asked whether the line on the screen matched line A, B, or C. The answers were obvious. Then, in order, confederates were asked with the participant being asked last. About a third conformed most of the time in the conditions where the confederates said the wrong answers. Three quarters conformed at least once. Nearly no one gave the wrong answer when no confederates were present in the room. So, what kind of influence is this? Normative or informational? Well, obviously normative. Normative influence involving peer pressure because they want to appear normal and conform. Normative influence and behavior is thus the opposite of anti-normative behavior, as in going against the norms. Informational influence, on the other hand, as discussed in the groups episode, is basically the social proof concept in thinking that others know more than you do. Now for the next experiment, the robber's cave experiment in the 50s. Done by who? Well, what do you know, good old sheriff discussed earlier. Two groups of 11, 12-year-old Caucasian boys in a middle-class background were separated randomly into the Eagles and the Rattlers for a week at a Boy Scout camp while building cohesion through group tasks unbeknownst of the other group. Then, for four to six days, they entered competition with the other group with some meager prizes for the winners, but nothing for the losers. Tasks were baseball, tug-of-war, etc., well, there was a great buildup of in-group favoritism and out-group derogation, a.k.a. hatred for the other group, like saying, those Rattlers, bunch of thieves is what they are. There was burning of the other's flags, stealing of property, and ransacking other's huts. The Robber's Cave Experiments provides evidence for Sheriff's realistic conflict theory, which argues that when a realistic conflict such as limited resources, or in this case offering a prize, is present, the two competing groups will develop negative stereotypes, beliefs, and discriminate against other groups. However, this may be fixable through the contact hypothesis developed by Gordon Allport around the same time as the experiment. The contact of these two groups for a common goal leads to a mutual understanding and reduces hostility. But a common goal was not the case for the competition. Do you remember what we would call this goal if it was in the competition? A subordinate goal, exactly. A recent meta-analysis of 500 studies validated this contact hypothesis in the most hostile conditions. Next experiment in the 60s was done by Stanley Milgram focusing on obedience in the light of the world wars. Put simply, 40 male volunteers separately entered a room with an experimenter and another confederate. They drew straws, but the volunteer was always the teacher of the confederate. The confederate was given words to remember, then asked to recall them from a list of four words, and shocked by the volunteer every time it was wrong with increasingly worsening shocks. The experimenter prodded the volunteer to keep going when necessary, saying things such as, don't stop, or the experiment must continue. Two-thirds continued to the highest shock, which would have killed the participants. All participants went to 300 volts. Obedience increased when distance was increased between the confederate and volunteer, and when the researcher was present. There are some clips of the study, and they're really brutal. The strapped-down confederate was consistently yelling, Get me out of here! You can't do this to me! I'm going to play the clip quickly. You can feel free to skip forward if you'd like. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Answer, please. Wrong. Nice. I'm up to 180 
Oh. Please continue, teacher. Neil, you're gonna get a shock. 180 volts. Stand it. I'm not going to kill that man, eh? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. You accept all the responsibility? The responsibility is mine, correct. Please go on. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paints. Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts. The answer is moon. Excellent. Fast. Bird. Car. Train. Plane. Go on, please. With the please answer. Four hundred fifty volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I not get no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. Don't you think you should look in on him, please? Not once we've started the experiment. Well, what if something's happened to the man hadn't attacked or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, it, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must... But he might be dead in there. This gave rise to the autonomous and agentic state. Autonomous, as you're in control of your actions, and agentic, as in you don't claim responsibility for your actions. Agentic state inevitably involves a lot of cognitive biases. All right, last one, the Philip Zimbardo's prison experiment in the 70s. Ten prisoners and 11 guards were chosen. Prisoners were arrested by real policemen, booked at the station, blindfolded, and taken into a makeshift prison in the basement of Stanford University. Guards could do anything but physically harm to keep order. Prisoners were given numbers as names. Guards were given sunglasses so they never made eye contact. What's so crazy is that by the following day, there was already rebellions by the prisoners. Barricading their door and ripping off their numbers in response, the guards took their beds, hosed them with fire extinguishers, and their leader was put in solitary confinement. Participants were chosen for their normalcy, but had been released within days due to signs of emotional disorders. Here is a short clip from a guard. I, I had really thought that I was incapable of this kind of behavior. I, I was surprised, you no, I was dismayed to find out that I could, uh, I could really be a, uh, mm, <laughs> that I could uh, act in a uh, manner so, so absolutely unaccustomed to anything I would even really dream of doing. And I, <laughs> and while I was doing it, I, uh, I didn't feel any regret. I didn't feel any uh, uh, guilt. It was only after afterwards when I began to reflect on what I had done that this began to this behavior began to dawn on me and I realized that this was uh, uh, this was a part of me I hadn't really noticed before these prisoners and guards were extensively de-individualized they had little recollection of who they really were this experiment was like Leon Festinger's social comparison theory gone wrong Social comparison theory argues that we desire to evaluate ourselves. We all want to know how our abilities stand up to the competition, right? However, because there's no objective or non-social means to do this, we must compare ourselves to others. Well, if you're comparing yourself to the other guards, then of course you believe you stand in line with them. You can compare yourself to people better than you, like guards, as in upward social comparisons, or people worse than you, as in the prisoners which would be a downward social comparison. Interestingly, one of the prisoners was released after just 36 hours because of the intense emotional episodes and crying. Crazy. So what kind of effects would this have had on the others in the study? Well, first off, the prisoners observing these emotions may start to feel the emotions themselves. This is called vicarious emotions, similar to empathy. Remember, vicarious means experience through others, as in vicarious learning from the memory episodes. 
But did the guards feel empathy? Well, of course not. Why? Well, the empathy altruism hypothesis states we will help someone, aka be altruistic, but only if they make us feel some sort of empathy. So the brutal treatments by these guards causes the empathy altruism hypothesis to argue that it is because they did not feel any type of empathy. Thus, the comparison of cost-benefit analysis was the main decision maker for these guards. How might Albert Bandura's reciprocal determinism shed some light on this prisoner experiment? Well, Bandura would argue that the first of the three components in his reciprocal determinism is environment, and this environment is supporting behavior similar to that of the prisons. This would then influence the individual component, thus the thoughts of the individuals would start to be, hey, I can call the prisoners derogatory words. I mean, we're in a prison environment, right? Lastly, this would affect the behavioral component. Thus, their behavior would start to be these guard-like acts. Then this influences the environment, furthermore creating a perpetuating cycle. This was Bandura's idea of reciprocal determinism. The environment affects the individual, which affects the behavior, which affects the environment again, and so on and so forth. And that's the end of the episode.